Hi, everybody. My name is Tishna Lodi. I work for the Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival. Uh, I am the panel coordinator, and I have my partner in crime, Violet, with me here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about directing, and we were lucky enough to have a very large group of, of directors want to be a part of this. So we actually were able to sort of separate uh, by gender to get different perspectives. So this is our male directors panel. Um, and we have a female one too uh, going on that we've done uh, just this past weekend. So we're going to have a really wonderful juxtaposition of, um, of, of these panels. It's going to be great. So thank you all so much for being here. I have panelists from all over the world here, so I appreciate the accommodation of time zones. Um, so we have uh, Gerald Perry here with us. He's going to be moderating today. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, hand it on over to him and just thank you again for, for your time and being here with us today. So Gerald, thank you for go ahead. Us. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Gerald Perry. Um, I am a, uh, an old guy, so I've done a lot of stuff in the movie business. I'm a film critic forever, a film professor forever. Um, I ran the Boston University Cinema Tech for many years, and Lloyd Kaufman was one of my guests a few years ago. I hope he remembers coming to BU. He was a I do. Guy. It was okay. great. Nodding, he remembers. And uh, the, probably the most important thing is I'm a longtime fan of the Science Fiction Festival, and I've written about it, and I, I think the most important qualification, at least once in my life, I spent all night watching films at, in live at the festival. And I still remember at five in the morning when there were just about 10 scattered nerds, including me, all over this room, who were gonna make it all the way till 7 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., watching science fiction. Uh, you know, it really is like a bucket list experience. So uh, today I'm thrilled to be the host of this, uh, this discussion, Zoom discussion with four male filmmakers. It's gonna be a manly macho discussion, of course. So everybody uh, put Good on try. that part of your garb. And, um, and, there, and so I, have, I think I'm probably the only person of your group who's seen all four of your terrific films and I'm really happy to talk about them. So I'm just gonna, uh, I have on paper here just, to, I'm going to uh, just do like a one sentence description of these movies, my description, so that people listening can have some idea of what we're, we're talking about. So we have, I should say we have three first time filmmakers, the three young men here, and Lloyd Kaufman my, from my generation is a legend in film business, the trauma, <laughs> there was Roger Corman and then there's Lloyd Kaufman. I think that's the way we say it in the uh, low budget world of genre filmmaking. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gerald. That was very kind of you. So Lloyd's film is called Shakespeare Shitstorm, and it's a version of Shakespeare's Tempest moved to today into a, a crazy story. The shitstorm is, in this case, is a, a bunch of whales flying over a boat, um, defecating on the boat, leading to this, to this and anyway, to this trip ending up in Troma, New Jersey, where Prospero and the various Shakespeare ca uh, characters are there, and Lloyd himself plays Prospero. Blood Moon from Caleb Spelios. Gerald, I, I apologize. You have to put the hashtag as part of the title of hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm. Oh, you got to remind me all night. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's very important. Very Shitstorm. important. You're gonna, I'm going to forget. Blood Moon, no hashtag. Okay, Kale's <laughs> film is, a, is the old story of a bunch of teenagers in a room. What's going to happen to them? Because outside, there seems to be martial law. Something is happening in the cosmos, and these kids are being freaked out by it. That's the setup. Infinitum, subject unknown, as another story with someone in a room. In this case, it's a, a woman who is gagged and tied and who gets away and is gagged and tied again and gets away and et cetera, et cetera. A little Groundhog's Day and a little of, uh, 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 yeah, uh, just a very, very original film, uh, a head trip film. I guess that's what I would call it. Um, then there is quite different, Turn Into the Future, Eric Schachmel's film, and this is a documentary. So we have three fiction films and one documentary. And this is a film about Hugo Gernsback, who a real life person who 
is sort of like Tesla, like Thomas Edison, but barely known, uh, criminally unknown. But in, in addition to doing all kinds of inventions, he was the originator of Amazing Stories magazine, uh, this fantastic pulp magazine, and the Hugo Awards in science fiction are named after him, and yet nobody knows about it. So this is this is a movie to learn, learn, learn about Hugo Gernsback. And I can say, and Eric, you will be surprised, I have actually read his awful novel, um, the, his night title I forgot, Ralph 12C4, I, I read it. And as you say in the book, it's a terrible novel, but he's a great guy, a great creator. So that, that's, the, that's the four movies all over the place. The only thing they have in common is their excellence. And it's <laughs> nice to have them here in this festival. So my first question is, I think I, I should, I, I forgot to mention, I'm also a documentary filmmaker and I have a film out there in the world right now in the COVID world. So this is what all filmmakers ask each other right now is, how do you get your film out there in the COVID world? It's hard enough anytime making independent films, but now it's practically impossible and yet all of you are sitting here. So. Can I just go around and I'll go with Eric next to me. So how is your film, you know, what can you do? Have you been stopped in your tracks or you're getting out there? Uh, well, uh, well, first of all, you know, thanks for this uh, lovely introduction. I'm quite flattered by the way you <laughs> described the work. I'm very, very glad that you uh, uh, received it like that. Um, but yeah, stopped in, in my tracks, I think you could say it. I actually, I was lucky to actually finish the film just on time before uh, the pandemic, like one year ago in January. Last year I was, uh, you know, color grading and uh, sound mixing. And we had the premiere uh, in March at the Luxembourg Film Festival. And we were like this, you know, middle of the week we were showing. And two days later, the festival, the rest of the festival was canceled because everyone went into lockdown. So we like just get it out there. But then, you know, what are you going to do? Nothing happened for, for many months. Uh, so it's doing the round in, in some festivals now. Um, there was a sale to a Scandinavian TV station. But it's almost like, yeah, as you say, like the kind of momentum that you would get from a release and like really getting into festivals with physical presence more. Um, I think that kind of potential enthusiasm was really kind of broken um, and, and stopped in its tracks. So. We'll have to I wait. Say that Eric, uh, you know. Eric is in Luxembourg. So maybe just, I think the question we'd like to know is how did you find out about the Boston Festival? And here you are, um, you know, at a major science fiction festival. Congratulations, all of you. Um, yeah, so <laughs> you, you just found it in your internet and... Uh, yeah, so I mean, with, with with my production company, we've been like doing you know a bit of research to see what kind of niche this film could potentially find. I think... Uh, you may have kind of hinted at it in a way already. It's not perhaps like the most broad public kind of film, although I think everyone could and should know about Gernsback and can learn something from Gernsback, even if you're outside of the science fiction scene. Um, but it's true that like to find that initial audience, I think uh, it, it has to be a community of enthusiasts who like get the subject and I think you know as we were like looking for the the right kind of audiences the right kind of festivals obviously you know Boston uh, Science Fiction Festival popped up so um, here, here we are. Okay Lloyd and so Lloyd you have you know I guess Troma has its own way of getting out its hundreds of films over the years and is uh, are you doing things exactly the same now or is it changed? Yeah, well, last last night we had a big party, big rap party. We had 400 people uh, in a small uh, in interior room uh, with no masks. Uh, it was very exciting. And uh, big, big, a joke? Hit, big hit. Uh, yes, that was a joke. Okay. Um, Not <laughs> that's, sure. that's a satire. Uh, and um, right now... Um, the uh, terrorists in Washington have been uh, doing a lot of promoting for uh, Troma because they're wearing the costumes that we used in uh, class of Newcomb High and return to Newcomb High and return to return to Newcomb High. And the idiots, the morons that they are, 
they um, not uh, they they don't uh, they they're non maskers. They're so stupid that. They may have worked for Truma, actually. That's stupid. They don't. They, they don't believe in masks. They have more cameras in the Capitol than any so place Lloyd, in the world. Lloyd, tell me about this. Okay, good. We know about what's going on right now in Washington. We hold our nose. But what? What about your film? So you're getting it. Well, we're getting a lot of free publicity. Just go check my Twitter and my uh, check out my Twitter. It's all. It's all. Uh, uh, people are asking why are why are those people wearing. Uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone's costumes from Troma's Cannibal the Musical. But they we're doing what Eric's doing. We're getting into some film festivals and uh, lining up. Um, we've had some drive-ins and we're lining up uh, theaters. If I direct a movie, Gerald, we can usually get about 200 theaters in the United States, one by one by one by one. And as I descend deeper and deeper into the uh, into the reeds of the underground, uh, 47 years of trauma, we've accumulated a very good fan base and they support us. They are publicizing, they're contacting their local movie theaters. So if um, um, we uh, get, uh, if and when we get out of this COVID mess, uh, uh, we'll have uh, some movie theaters. And uh, very often I go to the movie theater uh, and uh, make an appearance. Sometimes it's only one night Sometimes it's a week in L.A. and New York. I get two weeks if I'm lucky. And um, so the theaters come next. And Troma has its own... Uh, <coughs> we have our own uh, uh, streaming, a beautiful streaming service called Troma Now. Troma Now. First month is uh, free. And uh, we've got a, a, about a thousand uh, vi uh, wonderful visionary movies. Uh, about half of them are new uh, Filmmakers, uh, we've discovered many along the way, like James Gunn and Eli Roth and Samuel L. Jackson. And uh, I think Troma Now, you will be able to find uh, many, many uh, visionary, uh, young visionary filmmakers. Because, uh, it's, again, I mentioned Roger Corman because he's famous for finding all kinds of new filmmakers and getting them to work. And Lloyd also is, is in that great tradition of doing that. Caleb. Okay, your film, a, a little film, tiny little film, and it's a big world out there, a big COVID world, so. Yeah, um, I guess I'm trying to figure that out right now. I submitted to film festivals, very happy I got into this one. Um, it's been amazing so far, and I think, I think it's just, you know, as Eric said, you just kind of have to try to figure it out and go with the flow, and hopefully when things open back up again, we can put it in more places but for now letting it do its festival run and seeing what happens from there okay. and matt i think i saved you for last because you actually have a a covid story with the making of your film <laughs> uh yes i mean that's because it's actually not um, my first film but it's um uh so but because um yeah we shot this during uh, the sort of the full lockdown um in london sort of last um april may so our entire there's just me and my wife who run the film company on set and then the rest of our crew were watching remotely and then and we had people like ian mckellen and connor phil come on board but they were everything was they were filming at home and we had to direct over zoom and things like that um so because of that, um, and we were the only people in the UK filming at the time, so we had a lot of press following us going, what on earth are you doing? Because we have, you know, we, we, we're indie filmmakers, we make small films, but we're fairly well known in the UK for indie films. Um, so they were like, what on earth are Matt and Tori doing in the middle of this pandemic? But it was actually... Um, is that Edgar Wright's fault, I think? Because he, he, I saw a tweet from him going, I hope some indie filmmakers are running around London just shooting, because they were empty streets. It was like, you know, like it, was, you know it was a sci-fi. Well, I was like, I love sci-fi. Let's shoot some stuff and then start to see what we can sort of do with it. And then press got hold of that. And then people start, and then obviously like when Ian McKellen got on board, um, you know, more and more people sort of followed um, that. And we were very lucky that, um, uh, distributors who sort of know us they were seeing some of the early bits so they they took it on um fairly uh, about a week with us finishing it so and we've sort of got distribution all over the place which is crazy because it's our smallest film and it's already done <laughs> more than, um, than we've done with any of our other films before it's been released um so yeah and then we were invited to, to boston sci-fi which is like a dream come true for me it really is I'm a massive sci-fi fan so but like, the one time we you know our film gets in and we can't come it's very sad but there we go with Aaron. We miss everybody in Boston. We miss our European guests uh, 
not no. being here. So Matt, I'll, I'll ask you quickly this, and this will lead to my next question. So when you had uh, your wife, who's the wonderful actress in the movie, walking through the streets of a deserted London, mm. was the London literally deserted? This was a case where you didn't have to bring in police and you didn't have to clear things? You just... It, no, I mean, we, we got up, there, there were still sort of key workers going. So we'd get up um, really early in the morning and we would just sort of potter around um, because we were sort of allowed, you know, an hour of exercise. So we would have our hour of exercise, but we just happened to have a camera on a gimbal with us and she'd always just happen to be wearing the right costume. Um, so we did things like that. Yeah. And then halfway through, they changed the rules, said, OK, British filmmakers can go and do things if you can make it safe. So the second half of the film is in this huge Jacobean mansion. Um, which we knew would be deserted. It's actually part of a, an American university, but in, in Oxfordshire. So we just, we had the place to ourselves, basically, yeah, so. Well, that leads to my second question, which was, um, I, Lloyd might have a different answer, but, um, you know, when you, you know, there, we have, there's a Hollywood tradition of unbelievably expensive science fiction and fantasy movies with every technician in the world available to you and, and I can say that I am a real fan of low tech, mm -hmm. low tech science fiction. And so I found these films to be extraordinarily enterprising and what you managed to do, which seems to be on a very low budget. In Lloyd's case, I'm going to ask him, he had his is a maximalist film with every shot filled with thousands of things. Did he do that on the cheap or did he spend you know, five million dollars on, on making the movie. So why don't I start with uh, Caleb? Sorry about my phone. Um, Caleb, so um, yeah, so how did you uh, cut costs, cut costs, cut costs, and come out with a good film that you have? So first thing that I did was basically like use all my friends in any way I could and be like, do you want to come help out? We're shooting this thing over the summer. So a ton of that, just like Crafts and services was like peanut butter and jelly. We we weren't really like it wasn't anything fancy. Um, I reached out to any local businesses and we're, we're I was like, we've premiered a film before and we're gonna make this other one. We're going for a feature length one and if you want to sponsor us, we'll put your like logo in the credits and stuff like that. So I reached out to a local rental house, Lens Pro to Go, and they hooked us up with a discount, which like changed the entire film because it allowed us to get all sorts of equipment that I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to afford. And then we launched a Kickstarter to like recoup the last half that we needed. And so it was like a three month scramble just for anything to put this thing together and it's somehow managed to come together. Um, well, yeah, there's a, I, I guess I'm doing a little spoiler stuff. Maybe I shouldn't, but there's a kind of monster that's unleashed and at a certain point in the film um and it's really funny and kind of scary but uh can you could you give us the secret of that monster yeah that has to go to um one of my actors and producer ethan charles um i was like we need to make a tentacle and we couldn't we couldn't afford to, to buy like a prosthetic tentacle and i was like we, we aren't we can't do cgi it has to be practical completely it's the only way it's going to feel real and we knew that it would kind of, we, we, there was a lot of debate when we were making it, is this going to be too cheesy? But I love cheesy, and I think it just adds to the, to the fun of the film. And so he made it, um, he made it over one day with his sister, Olivia Charles, and they knocked it out of the park. Uh, it, yeah. was, it was incredible. <laughs> it's really good. So see the movie to see uh, that great yes. special, Thank special you. effect. Um, Matt, um, so your film, so there, there, you have these exterior shots of London and this blimp that's, uh, yeah, so maybe just talk about that shot, the, the blimp shot, which is really uh, eerie, very eerie. Uh, yeah, well, because it, Infinitum is sort of is set in a sort of a parallel world. So she wakes up and there's no one there. Um, and so, and you know, we we tried, as always, trying to do as much stuff in camera. So there's other versions of her and that's just camera trickery. There's no kind of, there's not CG and things like that. But because we, I did want to do, you know, I, I, 
you know, as soon as I see a Zeppelin or a blimp, I sort of immediately go, oh, sci-fi, something's going on. Um, and I'm just, you know, that's what I've grown up with. So uh, when we were shooting the London things, because there were no planes in the sky as well, there, were, there was nothing flying around it. Um, so uh, we just, we would send things over to our editor's brother to create little um, blimps for us. But that was CGI. So we, you know, we did, we did have to augment sort of a few things. And when the world flicker between the real real world into the into the other one we have we had to do some of that but i always sort of like augmenting things with cg rather than letting it be the the actual main thing so half of the trickery things it's just camera camera tricks to be to be honest apart from things like that and um, clearly a movie in which the there is you know one actor for 90 percent of the time and it's your wife and she's great she's a great actress amazing. Uh, is she wow. amazing yeah so uh um, yeah, so that clearly saves a lot of money on budget, and you can do, <laughs> then you can do your special little special effect. Okay, so Eric, you your problem then was how to uh, make exciting a story of uh, a scientist, and uh, again, so you know, and somehow, so I'm sure do you you know animators, you've got to hire animators. So wh where did where did your budget go? Right. Um, so the, the thing to know about uh, Gernsberg is also that um, before I started on the movie, there had been initiatives in Luxembourg to kind of um, make a documentary about him in, in the 90s mainly. And uh, those attempts uh, seem to always have failed because no one could unearth any proper like archive footage of the guy. Like there was nearly nothing. Um, and one of the clips, uh, actually the only two uh, video clips of Hugo Gernsberg uh, is one that uh, was given to me by one of his grandsons. And the other was uh, something we found on Getty Images, which only got um, digitized while we were working on it. Like when we started work, that didn't exist and that just popped up uh, at some point. So that was always the challenge. So we knew from quite early on that animation should be part of the deal, um, part of the storytelling technique. And um, my background is in motion graphics and somewhat, I mean, animation as well. So it was like my dream, you know, to have a feature film with lots of animation, lots of exciting stuff. And um, once, you know, and we started filming, editing, and it was kind of a, you know, stop and go, kind of filming some stuff, editing, seeing how the story was developing, going back to shoot some things. And so we left all the, the expensive stuff towards the end because you don't want to redo the animation. Uh, but by the time, like, the edit stood and everything was, like, mapped out story-wise and with uh, storyboards and animatics, uh, we arrived at the animators and we were like, so that's what we're going to do. And they were like, you're crazy. You know, we're nowhere near the budget that uh, we need for uh, what you're asking us to do. And um, so the solution that we found was like this motion comic approach where you, you know, you have nice anime, uh, nice illustrations, still images, and then you just animate like a couple of details. And at first that felt like a little bit of a defeat. Uh, to have to settle for, you know, the thing that's not like full animation. Uh, but in retrospect, and I think seeing the, the, the reaction that a lot of people had um, so far, who didn't know, you know, that this was a change of plan, uh, it seems to fit really well with what people expect from the visual universe of Gernsberg because the, you know, the, the, his, the illustrations of Frank R. Paul, his illustrator, the whole, um, the, the, the early magazines that lead to comic to, and to science fiction comic much later on, like this is the you know 1910s, 20s, um, these crazy illustrations that he published that lead to comic later on, all of that kind of resonates in, in, in this approach of still images that then get, you know, um, we blow some life into those. And, um, and that was part of the strategy to kind of take these images and bring them to life, but also combine these with scenes from Gernsback's personal life. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's that goes into another subject. But so this was like one of the techniques. Uh, but it was a good, it was a good one because when you explain it, because it, it it has a slight retro kind of feel about it, which is what you want for Gernsback. If you had the most fluid 
um, animation for today would be for another a wrong person. And by the way, a movie about his illustrator, I recommend another film. <laughs> his illustrator is a, one of the remarkable 20th century artists, I think. My gosh, he's, you know, thank you for introducing me to his, his artwork. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, the, he wouldn't have been uh, successful, I think, without him to the same extent. And uh, yeah. Lloyd, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So what? So seeing your film, hashtag hashtag Shakespeare Showstar. I have no idea if the budget was five hundred thousand dollars or if it was ten million dollars. I can't tell because there's so much going on. You have hundreds of people in the shot. Um, it's a it's a typical trauma film, excess, excess, you know, humor, dirty things, funny things, messy things, and all all sort of conceptually they work together, and uh, that looks like it costs a hell of a lot of money to do that. Um, but is this a low budget film or is it not one? Well, the budget was about half a million dollars, which uh, uh, according to the uh... Up the obscenity of the mainstream, uh, that's about 1% of a typical mainstream movie, which is uh, awful. Uh, the American and uh, mainstream movies are spending too much of our valuable resources uh, and labor on uh, bullshit. So uh, we've, <laughs> we've been doing this for 50 years, and uh, the, uh, uh, the half a million dollar budget kind of works. It doesn't work as well as it used to, but we've got a, a very dedicated fan base. And one of the ways we saved money is uh, we took a risk. Uh, we're, we're trauma, our corporate uh, slogan used to be movies of the future. Now it's uh, 47 years of disrupting uh, media. But uh, uh, Albania, Albania is a small country. Uh, they had the longest running dictatorship uh, for a while. And uh, they want to break into the movie business the way Bulgaria and uh, some of these other uh, interesting countries have, have done. Uh, uh, and as a result, Hollywood's going down the drain because so many studios have been built in these uh, Eastern European countries. So Albania wanted to attract an American company, but most of the American mainstream companies don't take risks. Uh, so they offered us a deal. We needed uh, uh, whales. We needed whales that would jump up in the air. And uh, it's all based on a, 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 the, this, this big storm in the tempest, in our tempest, uh, is uh, whales. Uh, it's called a fecal bloom, fecal blooms. Whales get together, in, uh, uh, at least they do for National Geographic, and they defecate together. on, on a, And it's a very important part of the ecological food chain. So this was, uh, we had to have the whales jumping over uh, a uh, Coast Guard ship, you know, that kind of stuff, like Free Willy. We wanted to make, fu make fun of Free Willy. And, uh, uh, and The Tempest is my favorite movie, so we thought that would be a good way to get the, uh, the storm going. And uh, since the movie, uh, hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm, uh, has uh, one foot heavily into uh, uh, satirizing the world of our uh, social uh, platforms like uh, Twitter bait and Twitter hate and third-rate bloggers, um, the, the hashtag is very important. Hey, so Lloyd, 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 yeah. let's go back a minute. So yeah, sorry. this film was shot in Albania and Albanians said they could provide the uh, the, the, the whale, the, the shitting whales, that was part of the deal? We, we had eight days in Albania. Uh, we shot uh, aboard, we needed a giant uh, boat or ship, a yacht of some sort. And in this country, we couldn't find anything for under $10,000 a day uh, that was big enough. Uh, so Albania came up with, uh, not only would they give us a Coast Guard, a coast guard ship, but uh, with the full crew, and, uh, uh, but they also had their own crews. Uh, we had the um, uh, Alexa camera, we had two of them, we had uh, drones. Um, I had to teach them how to make shit, of course, uh, with corn, because corn. everybody knows that whales eat a lot of corn, Joe. <laughs> we talked oh, about that in Boston. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, we took a risk, and indeed it worked out great. Uh, we, uh, you know, the, we got, uh, uh, the first time I've really used <clears throat> CGI to try to make it realistic was hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm. Uh, the Albanians did that for us. 
and um, uh, we got a very good technical crew for about eight days, and then we spent uh, another four weeks in uh, Queens, New York, filming uh, all the other scenes. Uh, uh, so this very quickly, uh, you're so you're the he's the star. You play Prospero, and you actually, by the way, you're very good when you do the actual Shakespeare lines. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, the Tempest, the Tempest is definitely my favorite movie, and I didn't want to do it while we were making. You mean uh, your favorite play? Uh, I, I'm sorry, my favorite Shakespeare play. Yes, and uh, uh, when we were doing, when James Gunn and I were, were doing uh, Romeo and Juliet, I was too young. I wanted to wait uh, till I was old and losing power and. Uh, uh, the Tempest is is perfect, so I think it's a very good uh, could be my swan song. It's a well, very King 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 Lear next. Trauma. <laughs> I'm That's just thinking the same. Okay, okay I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch to a whole different um, question, and and just whoever wants to answer first, because somebody will want to think about it. So this is the question: If you were on a desert island, what science fiction movie would you want to take there that you could watch again and again? So anybody? Well, that's a very good time. question. I know. Look how people are shaking their head. Yeah. I know, but you can't, I mean, can't pick one. I know, you can't I pick know. one. <laughs> okay, how about two? How about, is two okay? <laughs> Three? I mean, I, I would I definitely take Blade Runner and 2001 Space Odyssey as two. I think I'm, I'm yeah. Third one, I don't know. I mean, so maybe something a bit like Back to the Future, something a little bit more, um, a bit, a little bit silly. Or, yeah, oh, I don't know. Uh, Toxic Avenger as well might be a good one. I don't know. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank That's a classic. Yeah. Great. Space Odyssey and Toxic Avenger. Avenger. So That's good, Lloyd. Nice you're in there. Well, actually, one. I was up in the. Uh, you know, the projectionists uh, used to be uh, terrible. Uh, you know, it was a union and. You'd go, they'd put you, your film would be uh, projecting upside down in the theater and, and nobody would do anything. And I remember we had a screening or a sneak preview in New York uh, and I went up to the projection room to, to hang out to make sure that the uh, 185 uh, format was uh, done properly and that the people's heads weren't being cut off by the projectionist. And next in the, in the, in this, in the room next to mine in the theater was uh, Kubrick. Kubrick was doing the same thing. So uh, that's kind of interesting, speaking of, uh, yeah. Yeah, he's a perfectionist like you, definitely. Okay, Caleb, <laughs> you have time to think of your uh, science fiction movie. I think I'd have to go Blade Runner and, so you can and Alien, if I had to choose two. Blade Runner, okay. Blade Runner twice. That would be, I would be probably a Blade Runner Space Odyssey person. I would. I, Matt, you need to save me a seat next to you. <laughs> okay, fine. You're welcome. All right, Eric, do you have a favorite science fiction that you would want to take? Uh, yeah, it's a tough one. Does uh, Ghostbusters count? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. But probably, you know, either Blade Runner or 2001 as well. As Ghostbusters. Okay, so everybody has a these classic. great yeah. science fiction. Lloyd, you, you know, have a 2001 Space Odyssey. I saw it uh, on acid, of course, because I, 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 <laughs> I was uh, of that age when the movie opened. Yeah. Uh, where Bob O'Brien, uh, MGM was going down the drain, and Bob O'Brien, who ran MGM, took a risk on that movie and uh, paid off. Uh, so I saw it on acid, and uh, quite frankly, I thought it was pretty boring. Then I saw it not on acid. And uh, it was uh, it was uh, great. It was terrific. So I think the first time it went over my head. I don't know anything about the science fiction. Uh, most of what's in my movies over the fifty years is pretty much stuff I've gotten on my own from just yes. in my yeah. head. You know, yeah, out of your crazy head. Great yes. stuff, though, man. Well, what a, what a bunch of movies. What a well, great bunch of movies. Thank you, Gerald, and thank yeah. you, Boston. Thanks to Boston okay. Sci-Fi Festival too. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to switch to another question then. Um, why did you choose, I'd say Lloyd might be fantasy, but we have, uh, why did you choose science fiction as the form, your genre for your movies? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to start on that. You know, well, you I make did, a murder mystery, you made a... Uh, I, I didn't choose science fiction. I, I am not an expert. Uh, um, uh, trauma, the movies that I make are not uh, really any particular genre. They're trauma movies. Uh, uh, in France, they're called uh, trash, which is not a bad word as it is here. 
they're a unique uh, uh, genre, uh, trauma touch, like the Cinémathèque Française talks about the traumatic touch. Uh, I, I, I believe in, uh, I'm interested in comedy and satire. So uh, hashtag Shakespeare Shitstone is really uh, satire, and to some extent our movies over the years have made fun of the sci-fi, horror, uh, uh, sociological movies. So I, I, I have to say I... It, it isn't a sci-fi movie, although I'm very grateful that this wonderful festival selected hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm for the elements of sci-fi. Okay, we <laughs> won't tell the audience that it's not science fiction. They'll find out <laughs> when, when they get there. So anybody else, why did you choose to make a science fiction movie? Uh, Caleb, this is your first film. It could have been a detective story or... Uh, I, I just, I grew up watching sci-fi all the time it's a very close genre to my heart and i just wanted to take a stab at it um as an admirer of the genre okay matt uh i mean i, I mean so we've made a few films but this is our first sci-fi but um so the last one was sort of a victorian supernatural thriller and before that we've done a sort of a 70s um sort of hitman dark comedy but um the, uh, but sci-fi for me i mean my, my father was a massive sci-fi fan so you know we were watching things like 2001 since we were we had we had no idea what was going on, on either when we were sort of younger but you know that uh, it's mostly the books to be fair you know like asimov books and things like that and foundation's edge they would have been such a big influence on me i think as a person um and we've had this we had this idea of the infinite world which is a much bigger world for years and i think this year or last year sort of presented itself as the time that we could we could do the story to be honest so um that was sort of it was why it was you know partly reading rapid. science reading science fiction also um, yes in your case yeah. so eric uh, did you come to Gernsback as because you love science or did you come to him because you are a reader of science fiction or yeah yeah that's a good question um i mean i kind of rediscovered science fiction with uh, working on the film uh, and in a way I feel more like Gernsback found me than I found him so uh, like the project was actually uh, suggested to me by by my producer like he had um, a treatment in his drawer and the first time I even met him he was like do you want to have a look at this and um, I read uh, like the first abstract and I, I didn't know who Gersbeck was at the time and I think funnily enough a lot of people from Luxembourg don't know about Gersbeck and that he was born in Luxembourg that he spent most of his youth there um, but so as I was researching I thought you know I have to get back into science fiction and even though as you know as a teenager I watched a lot of movies I never really, I never really became aware of it as a genre, and I think the documentary, as such, isn't necessarily a science fiction film. It's kind of a traditional structure, but um, yeah, I, I had to go back to those roots and kind of rewatch a lot of things and uh, read a lot of uh, science fiction novels, um, and I think that really helped me to kind of get a sense of where this journey ended up that I described the beginning of. And um, I'm really glad that that um, that was part of the process that I could afford this time uh, to actually go, you know, and, and, and read, just read things that are not directly related. Like I obviously read a lot of um, the biographical stuff, the sort of more academic things about media and um, the inventions um, that he worked on. Um, but to just go and spend a lot of time on my free time as well. Um, seeing what the la science fiction landscape has been over the past, um, you know, decades it was quite quite informing, and I'm glad I. I'm going to say that the amazing American Amazing Stories magazines, those beautiful beautiful pulp magazines from the 30s and 40s are just uh, I covet them. I, I have a couple of things with H.P. Lovecraft short stories that mm. from you know pulp weird tales magazine. So they're very hard to find, and there you hold on to them um, if you if you get them. So Lloyd, were you ever a reader of science fiction? Not much. I read some Asimov when I was. I didn't really read science fiction. Uh, I, I've read a little Asimov. I read. Uh, I didn't remember the guy's name. Uh, uh, well, I've read very little. 
Uh, well, uh, yeah, certainly that's uh, the, the obvious stuff, uh, but uh, uh, the one that's a little... Uh, anyway, uh, uh, this uh, Tempest, uh, the Tempest is kind of science fiction, and, uh, uh, you know, Prospero's a magician, and uh, uh, getting old, and he's losing his powers, and uh, uh, he can imprison people in trees and stuff like that, and he, there's a monster in the movie, the Caliban, and uh, there's a, a beautiful love story, and the revel speech, all that stuff. So it's really more the the the, the whole gestalt of the tempest that, that got to me, and it is a, it is a fantasy above all. But it's a very hard movie to 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 make. The tempest is really not a good choice of a movie. Uh, if you say that in retrospect, after uh, you finished, you decided it wasn't a good choice. No, at the beginning, the big challenge with the tempest, the challenge with the tempest, it's all set up. It's all this tempest, this huge storm. And then, uh, uh, you know, Prospero's been kicked out of his land, as uh, his kingdom, and uh, he goes to this uh, faraway place, and then uh, uh, he gets revenge uh, on the people, but he never does anything. He just, he brings them to uh, Tromaville or to the island in the Shakespeare play, and then uh, once he proves himself, he just said, okay, uh, let's go home. You know, there's no, there's no follow-through. It's all set up. So uh, that's the biggest challenge, I think, to making The Tempest. And there are very, I think the best uh, movie of The Tempest, uh, I'm sorry I talked so much, but uh, since we're dealing, uh, since, uh, since uh, Matt is uh, British, uh, uh, I think uh, Derek Jarman's is the most interesting oh, yeah, that's uh, Tempest. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I think that's the best yeah. one. All right. No, it's a, it's a hard play in, in, any, in any kind of way. But, uh, but I, try, I tried to model my Prospero off of... Uh, 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 oh crap! No, uh, the guy who did it when I saw it at when I, at nine years old, uh, Morris Karanowski, or no, uh, and Maurice Evans. Maurice Evans. Uh, that was the first Tempest I saw, and uh, and you you can you can still see that with Lee Remick playing uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, and uh, and. Uh, and um, uh, Richard Richard Burton playing a Caliban. That's a, you can see it on uh, you can see it on YouTube. It was uh, like a I'll, I'll check it out. You know, no, that's TV fantastic. special. It is Anything quite good. Lee Remick. Yeah. And Roddy McDowell plays Ariel. Oh, that makes <laughs> sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, before I saw any of the movies, I was wondering if there if there's a shadow when you start making science fiction of Star Wars or in Star Trek over your heads that those are formidable and you have to deal with them in some way? Or do you, do you, do you think about those as you're making science fiction? Or is, would it, is it Blade Runner and Space Odyssey? Or you just start over as a blank and try to do your own little story? How do you, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know who I'm asking that to, but if anybody. For me, in my film, I mean, I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. Grew up watching them. That's super special to me. But just wasn't really the same kind of science fiction. Um, I was definitely more inspired by, like, John Carpenter. Um, mm. A lot of H.P. Lovecraft a little bit. A lot of, like, the weird fiction from, from that time period. And just stuff like that. Like, that's really where I got my inspiration from. That's interesting. So even H.P. Lovecraft was a, you felt him in your story. Definitely. Right? Like the, the nihilism of it and the, yeah. the, the cosmic horror definitely is a part of definitely, definitely. Like William Pope Hodgson, H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. Uh, Matt, do you have a, uh, any thoughts like feeling these giants of science fiction? Ah, well, I mean, the thing, I mean, the thing is, uh, you know, you can't really sort of sort of go up against them if that's sort of you know that's just sort of impossible. I mean, for for me, like with science, with uh, with all sorts of science fiction, for me, it's always like the science part of it. I'm a massive you know science geek, so that's the sort of stuff that intrigues me. So our film is about you know time travel and parallel worlds and things like that and quantum physics. Um, so that's sort of what took us um, you know to to down this sort of this this little route and this sort of story. Um, you know, and it requires a very different sort of. Um, film to be honest you know it's sort of it's a bit more sort of um I don't know it's, well, it's not slower but you know, it's a bit more thoughtful and you know quite science based rather than almost the fiction sort of side of it if that makes sense you know I, I like my sci-fi sort of rooted in okay so this is potentially this could sort of happen but obviously you know uh, not for quite some time so you know I just don't think you can sort of 
I don't know, have those beer moths sort of, um, you know, floating over you too much, I don't think. Well, also for the two of your films, I, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'll just talk for a second to Matt and Caleb. Um, I think it's Philip K. Dick, Paranoia, Paranoia is in the air in both movies of what's out there and what's mm. outside your house and and these forces that we don't know about. And is, is that, uh, am I getting the right feeling? Yeah, I mean, for me, like partially, it was like narratively at the budget I was working with, I was like, it's going to be almost scarier t to not see what it is than to fully see what it is because your imagination is always going to create something more horrifying than you kind of end up showing. And then it was just frankly, just budget wise. It's like if they're in the house, the whole movie and I don't have to show the outside, I don't have to spend as much money. And so <laughs> it kind of worked well. It worked out well. I agree with you. No, I, I just, that was my very thought watching your film. The paranoia is created by not leaving this house, and yet the budget is that's really good for your budget. In the thank same you, thing, thank you. So, uh, paranoia, same thing. Sounds quite similar of an idea. Yeah, we, we hardly ever leave that until she escapes and then she's going around. And, and it's the imagination, unless you, unless with those huge budgets where you can show all these, all these sort of things, it's so much more powerful. I mean, it's Shakespeare, you know, Shakespeare, you know, they wouldn't have the battles on stage because they didn't, they couldn't afford it. So you'd have the battle off stage, run on going, oh, there's a big battle over there. You know, we can, they, the audience would imagine far bigger things that they could ever put on at the, you know, at the, at the Globe, you know, theatre. So um. now back to that last one question about your blimp. So the blimp, as far as I see, has is never explained. It's just a a thing there that scares the hell out of you, right? Yes, it's all part of it. The thing is, because infinitum, the reason it's, it's infinitum uh, colon in, uh, subject unknown. I forgot the title of my own film. Then um, it's because it's a part of the infinitum world. So this is one little strand of other stories that are happening. So they're all sort of tying, going to be tying in with each other so it, it's all you know i mean a lot of it was about, about this woman being observed you know you've got ian mckellen and and Connor Thill and these sort of um, disembodied voices of scientists observing her that you'd never quite see so it was all part of that um trying to create that feeling of her constantly wherever she is she's always being watched by something you're never quite entirely sure what it is or why or who it is but there's this kind of you know just being watched i mean you know I don't know, you could talk about the patriarch and things if you want to do things like that. Um, but, you know, there's uh, yeah, there's ideas of that, but it all feeds into these other stories that we are developing and, and that are happening um, as well. I, I agree with totally, and, you, and, you, and yet you still don't explain the blimp except that it's there and looking down on you. Ooh. That's... Yeah, it's all part of the, the, the feeling of it, really, yeah. Lloyd, when you make your films, do you, uh, um, how much of the... How much of your films are, besides fun and grand entertainment, are, are social criticism? Are you talking about what's going on in the world? And I think my whole career has been uh, uh, informed by satire and comedy, which is the stupidest thing you can do because comedy is uh, subjective. What's funny in uh, Boston may not be funny in, uh, in uh, Albania. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, basically that's my beat. Uh, going back to a Battle of Love's Return in 1970, Oliver Stone's first uh, movie. Uh, they're all uh, based, they're all uh, examining our American culture in a fond way. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan of Preston Sturgis who uh, made fun of the uh, small American town, uh, which uh, in our case is Tromaville, New Jersey. Uh, uh, but it was in a fond uh, way that the, the good citizens are good, but unfortunately they are victims of uh, the uh, bureaucratic, the corporate, and the uh, labor elites, uh, blah, 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 blah. So uh, the hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm uh, objects to what's going with the brainwashing of the American public by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, one of the bad guys that uh, Prospero has to bring to it Tromaville, New Jersey, is the head of a big uh, pharmaceutical company, and uh, and uh, uh, this whole issue of uh, we have free speech in the uh, United States of America as long as we don't say anything, and uh, the cancel culture, all this uh, third-rate bloggers, third-rate bloggers building their their non-careers by destroying uh, people by fake. Uh, 
demolishment of people's, uh, 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 and, and it's happened to me, it happened to James Gunn. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but uh, luckily, Troma has a very loyal and active fan base, and our fans enjoy stirring this shit. And uh, I think uh, what I've just said kind of summarizes uh, uh, the movies that uh, I've had the privilege of writing and directing for 50 years. But so many of the movies we have are by uh, younger directors and totally different from uh, what I do, except that all the trauma movies are 100% um, personal, independent, and uh, uh, are uh, interested in art rather than just a formula. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we're nearing an end. So maybe what people always like to know when they have four wonderful filmmakers is what is their next project? This is hopefully not the end of your career. So, so Eric, <laughs> are, you, are you working on another film? Uh, so I'm uh, currently working at the Luxembourg National Museum of Natural History, which is obviously not a film project, but it continues in the same vein of science communication, which is all, you know, what Gernsback was all about. Um, no film project for the moment. Uh, I had to also kind of shake off the seven years that I spent on this project and uh, have to, yeah, like... Uh, yeah, find a different grounding for a little while, uh, but who knows, you know, what's on the horizon one day, way past COVID. So I hope uh, you make another see. film, of course, Eric. Thank um, you very much. Caleb, Caleb. <laughs> well, first off, Eric, just like, congratulations, seven years is insane. My film yeah. took like two years from start to finish. That felt exhausting. So just props yeah, to you, yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't full time, but it felt like it for you know big big stretches. Um, just having that <laughs> floating around your brain, and just working on. It, I mean, it's it's a lot of energy. I get it. That's impressive. Um, for me, um, I mean, COVID has made everything harder. Um, I managed to make three like micro shorts over the summer with a few friends. I've written two feature length scripts, first drafts, but I don't know. I, I really don't know when things start to open back up more. Maybe maybe I'll get another opportunity to make something bigger, but I love working with people. I'm hoping to do something soon. I'm hoping to collaborate with other filmmakers and just get experience and see where that takes me. Awesome. Thank you. And Matt? Um, well, the, the, the U.S. distributors um, of Infinitum love the world. They're huge sci-fi nuts. So they were delighted about um, Boston um, taking it on as well. Um, so I think they, they're going to um, want us to explore the, the world of Infinitum um, a bit more. So we have various ideas and, and scripts kind of working away on, on that. So hopefully back to sci-fi, which is great. Who's distributing, Matt? Um, uh, high octane pictures in the U.S., basically. Oh. So they've got U.S. and Canada. Um, yeah, and then Blue Finch over in the UK and Ireland and Australia and New Zealand and places like that. So. Right. But yeah, they're great people. Um, yeah, high high octane pitches. They're 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 massively um they, uh, you know, they're hugely sort of with and for independent filmmakers. Um, you know, and they kind of really try and champion people once they kind of have got them sort of in the high octane family. So exciting. Well, and Lloyd, I assume you're quitting. That's it. No more movies, right? Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm the uh, herpes of the movie industry. I, I, I refuse to go away. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, uh, I'm producing three movies, uh, one of which is in England, uh, in Sheffield. Uh, it's, been, it's been shot, uh, and then two other movies by other directors, uh, in, uh, which have all, they're in post-production. One of them has to still shoot a little bit. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm looking around for a one-of-a-kind one script uh, it can be any genre, even a rom-com, as long as it's original and uh, one of a kind and might make the world a better place a, a tiny bit and, uh, and entertaining, of course. So if anybody out there in uh, Boston sci-fi land uh, has a, a script, I don't uh, look at the movie industry as a profit center. I never have. So, uh, and that's why The Toxic Avenger is still, uh, when the drive-ins got popular again, we we're all over the place in drive-ins, thanks to the gift of COVID, but yeah. uh, we, we make movies that uh, stay as uh, classics, underground perhaps, but they come from the heart, soul, and brain of the filmmaker. And uh, 
I'm looking for my next uh, project in that regard. And uh, uh, when my wife isn't looking, I just uh, take a check from the back of her checkbook and uh, finance the movie. <laughs> Thank you, Lloyd, for that, for the world of people with those scripts sitting in there. Yeah, yeah it would be very, if anyone has something, you know, not formulaic. I'm, uh, everything we've done has usually been against the formula. So uh, anything that's one of a kind would be terrific. Mm -hmm. By the way, my wife apparently just heard that remark. Okay, about the checkbook. Yeah, uh, he's yeah. hiding the checkbook. I no well, I'd like to thank this fantastic panel. Boy, that was really fun talking to everybody. I don't know, do I send it back to you? Uh, to yeah, I, I thank you very much, uh, Lloyd. There's certainly, uh, we have a plethora of amazing filmmakers and who are constantly writing and looking for for ways to produce something. So I'm sure, uh, I'll be sure if we find anything particularly special to throw it your way, but- Thank um, you, thank uh, you. <laughs> thank you all so much for being a part of this panel and for taking the time. Again, I know many different time zones, so I really appreciate it. Um, that was a really, really great conversation and really fun to hear everybody just history and how you made your particular film and also your careers. And we're so excited to, to have all of you in our festival in some way. Um, and hope to have you again. And um, just thank you so much for the time. And thank you, Gerald, for all of your really wonderful You're thoughtful welcome. questions. Yeah, thank really you very much. Thank it. you. Um, thank thank you, you, guys. Thank you, guys. Everyone, it was lovely. Thanks, Gerald. Thank you, Boston. And congratulations to all you male to film directors. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, it's a little unfair because in hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm, I also play uh, Prospero's sister. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You're giving too much. Spoiler alert. I don't want to hear about it. My <laughs> large, my, You're giving my, it away. My I'm large no, the meeting. No, I wish you talked more about that. That would have been real. <laughs> no, not, well,